Okay, welcome back. We will get going today. Uh, we're going to continue on today with not all of, but other sections of Chapter 2. So we are going to spend at least one or two more classes after today on Chapter 2, which, as I said, is quite a lot. I believe after today you should be able to do the next homework assignment. We'll have covered all the material for the first Chapter 2 homework. That will be due next Sunday, so there's no excuse not to get an early start on that. The only announcement I have today is related to homework, so there was one due last night, as you hopefully were aware of. Um, if you didn't do it, then I guess all I can say is don't let it happen again. Uh, so you're going to have homework assignments every week now, so get in the habit of doing them. And, and as I've always emphasized, doing attempts throughout the week, getting some of them in early is certainly going to be helpful for you to learn this uh, as we go along. And the first homework review video was posted earlier today onto, onto the YouTube site. Uh, so I go over about eight or so questions from this previous assignment that seemed to be the most difficult and kind of uh, you know, reviewed some of those topics. The files associated with that are also posted in Blackboard, so if you want to you know, download the questions that I did and go through them on your own, you are able to do that. Um, all right, so that's going to be the, really the only announcement we have today before we jump right back into what we're talking about. What we closed with last week was we're starting to now describe how electrons behave in atoms, how are they arranged, energy levels of electrons as they uh, relates to the, their distance from the nucleus and things of that sort. And the first model we covered was called the Bohr model. And this is often referred to as the planetary model. So we saw that it has basically a nucleus at the center, as we now know is, is the case. And then the electrons move in perfect circles around the nucleus. And there are certain fixed distances from the nucleus that they are able to be. And those distances each correspond to an energy level. So as you get further and further away from the nucleus, the energy of the electron goes up and up and up. And there's, again, just certain fixed values defined by the quantum number n. Now, a question came up at the end of class. Yeah, I'll go ahead. So. That, is that a, but that starts here, right? Yeah, so there will be overlap in the notes sometimes. So the question was, we didn't finish the last two slides from last time. And that was on purpose. I often give a little bit more notes for you guys to bring to class than I'm actually reasonably able to get through. So if that's the case, we will cover them in the next class. So there will be some overlap sometimes, as you'll see. Um, but what we did finish with last time was a description of the Bohr model in sort of qualitative terms. The question came up, well, why doesn't the electron just crash into the nucleus if there's you know, a negative charged electron and a positive charge in the nucleus? They should be attracted to each other. Why does the electron stay a certain distance from the nucleus and not just go into it, there were actually, the Bohr model doesn't have a satisfactory explanation for that. So that was one of the things about the Bohr model that was sort of you know, unsatisfying, maybe not completely uh, covered in that model. And we'll see today that that's one of the limitations of the Bohr model that we'll go through. But what we want to talk about today is with the Bohr model of the atom, what are the, some of the equations that are involved with that? So now sort of getting at it from a more quantitative standpoint. So the first thing we'll talk about are the equations for the energy levels. So again, this is as the electron goes further and further away from the nucleus, the energy that's associated with that electron. There, are also, there also is an equation that deals with the radius of each of the energy levels, each of the orbits, but we're not going to talk about that because it doesn't have a lot of physical significance for us. So we'll just talk about the energy levels today uh, and in general in this course. All right, so the energy of a single level in the Bohr model, there's this constant minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. This one is not on your periodic table, so you're going to have to learn this one. It's not that hard, uh, just one number. And then uh, what is gonna, what's going to determine the energy level is actually two things. Um, Z, which is the atomic number, squared over N squared. And N is that quantum number that we talked about, which designates each energy level, the, the larger values of N being the ones that are further and further away from the nucleus. Um, and so the way that this equation is set up, and this is sort of the convention we follow in chemistry, is you'll notice that it's a negative number. Um, and it's going to approach zero as n goes to infinity. So if you've taken pre-calculus, which you all should have, you probably learned a little bit about limits. And so basically the limit as this equation goes to infinity is zero. And then as you go closer and closer to the nucleus and n gets smaller and smaller, you're going to get to larger and larger negative numbers. Now it's a negative number because the convention in chemistry and physics is that if you're talking about potential energy of interaction between two charged particles, which is what we're doing here, the proton in the nucleus and the electrons that are around the nucleus, that's going to be conventionally given as a negative number whenever you have two like charges that are interacting with, or sorry, two opposite charges interacting with each other as we do here, the energy will be negative. So that's why it's negative in this case as well. Um, now, one thing about this course that I should point out is that in this equation, as I said, we have two terms where Z is, a, is, a, is still defined as the atomic number. We defined that last uh, pretty early in the course. Uh, 
which is the number of protons in the nucleus. Now, technically speaking, this equation does include that term, but all the problems that you'll have in the homework assignments are going to deal with just hydrogen, where Z is 1. And so really this term is going to drop out. So I'm not actually going to show Z squared in any of the problems that I do because you guys don't really have to deal with that ever as being an option. But in the case where there would be more than one proton in the nucleus, you would have to account for that in this equation. But that's not going to actually come up in any of the problems you do. And then N here is the quantum number, which we defined last time. And as we said, it's related to how far away from the nucleus you are, or in this case also has a mathematical dependence on the energy level. So this is a form of the equation that deals with the absolute energy value of one of those orbits in the Bohr model. We're not actually going to use that too much because, experimentally speaking, you can't really measure that number uh, in, in direct way. So typically the way that we're going to deal with this then is actually as a change in energy level. So as we talked about last time, in the, in the Bohr model, when an electron hops between energy levels, either going to a higher energy level or a lower energy level, there's going to be a photon involved. Um, and, and so it's going to, what we're going to typically measure experimentally, either by measuring the emission or absorption of a photon, is the change in energy, the difference between two energy levels. And so all we do is we take this equation with two different values of n. Remember that as, as we go through those processes, the value of n is changing and we just subtract the two from each other. So what you get then for delta E is, again, final minus initial is what delta always refers to. And we get this form of the Bohr equation, which is going to be the one that we're going to use most frequently. It's helpful to know both of them, but they're, they're closely related to each other. Uh, it's just taking two different energy levels and subtracting them to get the difference between them. And so what you would write this in is 1 over nf squared, where nf is the final value of n that you're uh, considering, and then ni, initial value of n. So basically this is going to be the equation we use whenever we're dealing with absorption or emission of a photon, where an electron is changing to a different energy level, either going up to a higher value of n if it absorbs a photon, or coming down to a lower value of n if it's emitting a photon. And so we're going to use this as nf and ni, where n is the final value of n, the, the, the energy level that you terminate in for that process, and then ni is the initial value. All right, so that's going to be two, sort of two forms of the same equation, the second one being the one that we'll likely use more often. Now, one of the ways that we can, you know, anytime we come with a new model, so the Bohr model being a, a, a model for the atom, you want to validate it in certain ways by measuring certain parameters and seeing, you know, do these equations actually predict uh, what, what we observe in reality? And one thing that they observed and predicted with the Bohr equation was the, what's called the ionization energy of hydrogen. Now we're going to talk about ionization energy in a lot more detail coming up soon, but basically what ionization energy is would be taking a hydrogen atom and removing an electron completely from it, so to form a hydrogen ion, H plus in this case. And for any, for any element, this is what the ionization energy would be described as, it's, it's removing one electron from that atom. All right, so this, would be, this value here would be referred to as the ionization energy of hydrogen, whatever energy it takes to remove that electron completely. And you can use the Bohr equation to predict what that would be. And so the way you do that is in ionization, basically what, what's happening is at the final value of n. So the electron is starting in n equals 1 in the ground state of the hydrogen atom. And then you're removing the electron completely. And in the context of the Bohr model, removing an electron completely means that you're going to a final value of n of infinity. All right? So basically, that's the situation where the electron is completely removed from the atom. And then we can use the equation I just gave you to predict what's the energy change associated with that, which, would, which should match with the ionization energy of hydrogen. So if we use this delta E equation, minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joule, this is the equation for a single atom of hydrogen. Um, and then the two n values, n f squared minus n i squared, And we're going to use NF is going to be infinity, NI is going to be 1, because we're ta talking about the ground state of hydrogen. We could also predict ionization energies for other states of hydrogen where, where the initial value of N is not 1. But if we're doing it for ground state hydrogen, the initial value of N is 1, and we just plug those numbers in. So we get 1 over infinity squared minus 1 over 1 squared, which is the initial value. This whole thing goes to 0, to 1 over infinity. And so what we get then is just that constant value that's out front, minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So this number here 
represents the ionization energy of hydrogen and it matches perfectly with what you would measure experimentally. So this was one way to validate the Bohr model is that you can predict the ionization energy of, of hydrogen and it matches perfectly with what you would measure using an experiment. So that, that was sort of um, some evidence that this equation had some validity. The other thing that it allows you to do, and this is how we're going to use it a lot in this course, is it allows you to predict the wavelength of absorption or emission for a hydrogen atom that where the electron is moving between energy levels. So as we talked about when we were first introducing the Bohr model, one of the key observations that led to its development was the atomic line spectrum of hydrogen. The, if you excite a, hydro, a sample of hydrogen using a, a high voltage, and then you measure the light that the hydrogen atoms give off when they're excited, we got four very specific wavelengths that were observed in the visible range. Not a continuous spectrum like you get for white light, but what's called a line spectrum where you get just a few discrete wavelengths. And this equation allows you to predict what those wavelengths are, what, what, what those wavelengths are and they match perfectly again with what you observe in the experiment. So it's um, further proof that this equation has some validity. So the key idea here is that the energy of the photon that's involved in one of these processes, absorption or emission, is going to be equal to the absolute value of the change in energy, delta E. All right, so we have an equation for delta E now that allows us to predict the change in energy as an electron goes from a lower to a higher energy level or vice versa. Yes? Uh, it's, it's a negative and then a negative. So it should be a positive. You're right. Sorry. Yeah, ionization energies are always defined as positive numbers, so that, um, that's my bad. All right, thanks for pointing that out. But anyway, back to what I was getting to here, which is that we have an equation for delta E in terms of the values of n, the quantum numbers, and then we can relate that to the energy of the photon that would be either absorbed or emitted as the electron traverses between those energy levels. And so then what you can do is using these sort of in concert with each other, we also have equations for the energy of the photon as it relates to the wavelength and frequency. So remember that the energy of the photon is also equal to h times nu, which is equal to hc over lambda. So what we can do with these two equations in combination with each other, the Bohr equation for delta E, and then these equations that relate the energy of the photon to the frequency or the wavelength, is that we can predict then what frequency or wavelength of the photon would be involved as an electron either goes, is absorbed, as a, as a photon is absorbed, the electron goes to higher energy, or as a photon is emitted and the electron comes back down to lower energy. Now one thing to keep in mind, the reason that we have these delta E in uh, absolute value brackets here is that delta E can be positive or negative as we talked about last time. So it's going to be positive when you absorb a photon and that's where you go from a low value of n, your initial value of n is a smaller value, to a higher value of n for your final value. So that's again when the energy levels are increasing of the electron as it goes up to higher energy. And then delta E would be negative for an emission process which is where you're starting out at a higher value of n, and then your final value of n will be a lower value. All right. So delta E that you get from the Bohr equation can be positive or negative, depending on the relative values of nf and ni, which one's higher or lower than the other one. The photon energy, though, and the wavelength and frequency that you calculate from that should always be positive numbers. So remember that when we're ever talking about an energy of a photon, it's always a positive quantity. You don't have a negative energy of a photon. Um, but the delta E that, come, that it comes from can be a positive or a negative quantity. All right, so this is going to make more sense as we start seeing how to use it. Um, but one more word of caution is that, and we'll, we'll get in more details on this later today, is that this Bohr equation that I gave you, it's not a general equation for all elements on the periodic table. It only works for systems that have one electron. Now, the only atom that has one electron is hydrogen. So really, the only neutral atom that the Bohr equation works for is hydrogen. There are other ions that it could potentially work for. So if you had you know, helium plus or lithium two plus or beryllium three plus, these would all be ions that have one electron. There's many other that you could dream of. Most of these are not actually stable ions that we would observe naturally anyway. But the Bohr equation would apply to those. We'd have to put that Z term in for the different atomic numbers. Not, you know, For hydrogen, it's one, but for helium, it'd be two, three, four, and so on. So the Bohr equation could work for these, but like I said, in this course, we're only going to deal with hydrogen. But we do want to be aware that it is limited in that sense. You can't use the Bohr equation for you know, any other element except for hydrogen, basically, is essentially what it boils down to in this course. 
All right, so that's the limitation of the Bohr equation, so we can't use it for anything else. But it does, again, allow us to make some predictions and things about the hydrogen atom. It was you know, a very important early idea in atomic and electronic structure. So let's go through some different ways that we can sort of ask questions using these Bohr equations, a, a few different variations and things that you might see similar on your homework assignments this week. So the first question is just a true or false question. So we, we, had, we talked about the first equation we gave you was for the energy levels as a function of the quantum number n. We want to know, is this energy level minus 9.72 times 10 to the minus 20 joules, is that an allowed energy level for the hydrogen atom? So remember, one of the key points of the, the Bohr model is that you don't have a continuous energy spectrum. You have just very discrete energy levels that are allowed by that equation. And let's figure out if this is one of them. So the way that we do this then is we remember that the absolute energy is going to be given by the Bohr constant. Because this is hydrogen, we don't have to worry about the z term. It's just going to be 1 over n squared. So if we're talking about the energy of a single energy level, an absolute value of energy, as it is here, we just use this equation. We're not talking about two different n values, so we're going to use just this form of the equation, which has one n value and applies to one energy level. And then what we're going to do in this is we're going to take this given energy level and we're going to solve for n. And what we have to remember from the Bohr model is that n has to be an energy, integer, one, two, three, four, so on. That basically is going to limit the energy levels to certain allowed values. And so if we solve for n and it's not an integer, that means that this is not an allowed energy value. So it really just comes down to some algebra here. So this energy value, nine, minus 9.72 times 10 to the minus 20 joules, if it's an allowed energy level for hydrogen, it must satisfy this equation here. So we're going to take, this is going to be E, this is going to be the equation on the other side. And it must satisfy this equation where N here has to be an integer value. So unless, we, unless N is an integer value, unless it satisfies the equation with N being 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, this is not going to be an allowed value. So if we do a little bit of algebra here, I'm not going to go through the algebra in detail, but if you have any trouble, please let me know later on, and I'll, I'll walk you through it. But basically what we get is that N squared is equal to 22.4 which as if you know your square roots, you already know that that's not, and then n is going to be the square root of that number, which is 4.74. Now that's not even really close to an integer, so because this is not an integer, that leads to the, equation, the, the conclusion that this is a false statement. This is not an allowed energy value for hydrogen. Okay, so any of the allowed values for hydrogen would have n being an integer value. So here we're sort of working backwards. We're not solving for the energy level. We're giving you a hypothetical energy level, and you have to solve for n to figure out if that's an integer value. So that's one way we, we can use the Bohr equation. But as I said, the more common types of problems are going to be absorption and emission transitions. So again, situations where we're starting and ending at two different values of n, two different energy levels, and then asking some question about what's the wavelength of the photon that's either absorbed or emitted in that process. Okay, so the first question here is exactly that situation. So we want to determine the energy and wavelength of light that's emitted when hydrogen relaxes from the second orbit to the ground state. All right, so anytime you see these types of, of problems where you're talking about you know, hydrogen atoms, absorption, emission, different energy, you know, different energy levels, we should automatically think of that form of the equation that I gave you here, which is um, this delta E1, so in terms of two different n values. And so the way we're going to typically do these types of problems is we're going to start with this equation. We're going to figure out what delta E is, and then we're going to work from there to relate that to either the wavelength or frequency or some other property of the photon. Okay, so in this problem, we're given uh, the information directly in the problem that we need, this, although it's not stated in direct terms. So NF and NI, so it's going from the second orbit to the ground state. So what this tells us is that if we're in the second orbit, that's another way of saying that the initial value of N is 2. And then remember, the term ground state here refers to the lowest energy state of any, of any atom, in this case a hydrogen atom, which means that the final value of n where we're ending up is going to be equal to 1. So we're going from n equals 2 to n equals 1. We're decreasing the value of n, so that's going to be an emission process as we're saying here. 
And so anytime you see the word ground state, that means n equals 1. And so in this case, we're ending up at n equals 1. So we're going to put those two values of n into this equation. In this particular problem, we don't necessarily need to get the sine of delta e right. So if you switch the two n values, it's not going to be disastrous in this problem, but um, it is important to get it right in most cases. So here, nf is the final value of n. That's going to be 1, as we said. And then the initial value of n is 2, so it's going to be 1 over 1 squared minus 1 over 2 squared. And so when we multiply this across, we get a delta E of minus 1.64 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Now it's always good when you're doing numerical problems to check yourself periodically and make sure that the answer you got is reasonable. So we said that this is an emission process. We're going from a larger value of n, which is 2, to a smaller value of n, which is 1. That means delta E should be negative. So if you did this and got a positive number, it probably means you just switch these two. In this problem, that wouldn't actually make any difference at the end of the day. But at the same time, it's good to check yourself and make sure that what you're getting is reasonable. So in this case, we get a reasonable negative number. But what we're asking about is the energy and wavelength of light of the photon. That's what this problem is dealing with. And so we have to relate this delta E to the energy of the photon. And recall then that the energy of the photon, in this case the emitted photon, because it's an emission process, is going to be equal to the absolute value of delta E for the electron. So it's just going to be 1.64 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. All right? So that's the first part of the question. What is the energy of the photon? It's just that number there. So in magnitude, those two are going to be the same. The delta E for the electron, the difference in energy between the electron starting in, in, in or initial and final positions, and then the energy of the photon being the absolute value of that. So we're done with that part of it. Now this also asks for the wavelength of light that's emitted. Okay? So lambda, we can relate that to the energy for the photon, which is hc over lambda, and then a little bit of rearrangement of that equation, we get this here. So remember that once we know the energy of the photon, we can relate that to the frequency and or the wavelength. And so this is just rearranging the wavelength equation and then plugging in the numbers that we need to solve for lambda. So it's going to be h, which is a constant that we, that we dealt with a lot last time. C, which is the speed of light. And then we're going to put in the energy of the photon that we just determined from uh, the step above, which is 1.64 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. And so when we solve this out, what we get is 1.21 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. We didn't specify a unit here, but typically wavelengths would be in nanometers, so we're going to report that as 121 nanometers and most likely if this is multiple choice that's what your answer choices would be in okay so we have to convert this back to nanometers if that's what we were have been asked to do so this is a pretty typical type of problem in this section of the course in the, using the Bohr model where we're going to really have two steps involved we're going to use the Bohr equation to find delta E the change in energy for the electron and then we're going to relate that to the photon energy and figure out either the wavelength or the frequency or something along those lines. So there's not a huge number of variations in these problems, but I want to make sure I go through as many of them as I can, and you'll see them on your homework assignment to get some practice. So any questions on this one before I move on? All right. Sorry, is there one? Sorry. Three times 10 to the eighth, that's C, which is the speed of light. So in this equation, it's H times C divided by the photon energy, E. Um, and so these are both constants, which you'll find on your periodic table. So we're multiplying those together and then dividing by energy to get wavelength. Yep. Yeah, because um, if we go see what that actually is, it's 2.9 with a lot of nines. Um, all right, so here it is. 2.99792, so um, you'd have to round it to four significant figures to not have it be three times 10 to the eighth. And typically in these problems, we're going to have you know three significant figures at the most, so like you're going to be fine if you just call it three. It's not going to change your answer by enough to, to cause you. Remember in Blackboard, even if it's a numerical problem, you have to type in the answer. We give you like a one or two percent window, so the difference between 2.998 and three is... I don't know, like 0.6% or, or maybe 0.06%, it's a really tiny amount. So it's not going to affect your answer if you just call it three. But it is a good question to bring up, but um, not going to have to worry about that. All right, anything else?
All right, let's uh, refocus in for another one. So next question is very similar along the, uh, uh, along the same lines, but a slightly uh, different setup. So here, hydrogen undergoes a transition from n equals 3 to n equals 5. And so the first part of this is a qualitative question. Is a photon emitted or absorbed during this process? And what is its frequency? Now, to figure out if a photon is emitted or absorbed, we don't have to do any math. We just have to remember the definitions of absorption and emission, how they relate to the n values. So in any case, when we're going here, we're going from 3 to 5. So we're going from a lower value of n to a higher value of n. And anytime that's the situation, that means a photon is absorbed because the electron is going to a higher energy value. So it has to absorb the energy from the photon to be able to do that. So anytime you're going from low end to high end, it's absorption. If it's the opposite, it's going to be emission. So just for the first part, we just have to know the definitions. We don't have to do any math to figure that out. But the next part does involve the same set of steps we just went through, which is we want to know, okay, now we know the photon is absorbed. What is the frequency of that photon? And that's typically going to be a two-step process. We're going to start with a Bohr equation and figure out what the delta E is, and then we're going to relate that to the energy of the photon, which can be used to find frequency or wavelength. Okay, so delta E first, we're going to use that same equation we've been working through multiple times already. And it's going to be 1 over nf squared minus 1 over the initial value of n squared. So nf is the final value. It's going to n equals 5, so we're going to put that first. And then initial value of ni is going to be the second one, which is 3. And again, this is an absorption process, so it should give us a positive number, which it does. In most cases, if you mess up the sign of delta E, it's not going to you know, doom you at the end because the energy of the photon is just the absolute value of that number anyway, so it's not going to... But in some cases, if we ask you about delta E, you need to make sure you get the sign right, so we are going to be careful about that. So that's delta E for the, uh, for the electron, for the atom. And then we're going to relate that to the energy of the photon. And so remember that the energy of the photon is just equal to the absolute value of delta E. And it's going to be equal to H times frequency. Okay? So we're going to set this value, which is the energy of our photon, equal to h times the frequency. So the frequency then is going to be the energy of the photon divided by h. And now we just have to plug in the numbers. So this number here in the absolute value form, which is the same number, is the energy of the photon that's absorbed. And then we're going to divide that by h, which is Planck's constant. Now, I realize I'm being internally inconsistent because I call C 3 times 10 to the 8th and I call H 6.626. That's just how I remember them, so it's just more like muscle memory at this point, so don't hold me over the fire for that one, please. All right, and so we have these two numbers that we're going to divide to get the, the frequency new, which is going to come out to 2.34 times 10 to the 14 hertz. And so we are going to absorb a photon of that frequency in this process. So anytime you're going to a higher value of n, you're absorbing a photon. And then we can figure out the frequency, again, two-step process typically. Bohr equation followed by one of the two equations for photon energy that we learned last time. Okay, so just a slight variation on the previous one. We're in here, we're solving it for frequency instead of wavelength. And then the last one here is, I guess there's two more here, but um, only one of them involves math. Um, so the the passion series, so in, in these hydrogen atom transitions, people have studied them to death, and so you can, you know, you can measure transitions um, you know, to different energy levels, and then everybody who studies those gets them named after themselves in, a, in an act of narcissism. So uh, when Passion studied transitions terminating at the third energy level, he called, he I don't know if he named it after himself, but probably those scientists do. Um, and anyway, that's referred to as the Passion series, any of those transitions that goes from some value of n larger than 3 to n equals 3. So basically an emission process is what he's studying, and it goes from either n equals 4 to 3 or 5 to 3 or 6 to 3 and so on, and you measure the wavelengths associated with all of those and got that whole series named after him. So anyway, that's a little bit of stupid background that you don't need to worry about, but for this problem we have that background is necessary because we're observing a Passion line, a passion line at 1094 nanometers, and we wanted to determine then what energy level did that originate from, some value higher than 3 for the passion series as an emission process. So it's going to be from, again, 4 or 5 or 6 and so on. So here we're actually working backwards. Normally, as I said, we're going to, in a lot of cases, we're going to solve for the wavelength that's either absorbed or emitted. Here we're giving you to that, that to you first and working backwards. One thing you're going to have to be able to do in this course, and you'll see it 
uh, the more homework attempts that you do is you're going to have to be able to work backwards in many of these problems. So there's always you know, a forwards and a backwards way of doing things, and you have to be able to go in both directions to really understand it and be able to solve them. So here, as I said, we're giving you lambda first. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually solve for delta E. So remember that the absolute value of delta E is equal to the energy of the photon, which is equal to HC over lambda. Okay? So here we have the energy of the photon, we can, we can solve for that using the given wavelength, 1094 nanometers, okay? So we're going to use HC over lambda, the given wavelength, to figure out what the absolute value of delta E is, the energy of the photon that's emitted in this process, with those two being equivalent to each other. 1094 nanometers, we have to put that into meters to get the units to work out. So as you'll recall, we have to always convert these. I'm not going to show the conversion, but this would come out to 1.094 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. And so that gives us a photon energy of 1.817 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So that's the energy of the photon that's emitted. That's equal to the absolute value of delta E. In this case, we're, tolding, we're, we're telling you that it's atomic emissions. That, that word, that keyword is in the problem. And so because it's an emission, that means delta E has to be negative, less than zero, because we're going from a higher value of N to a lower value of N. So anytime it's emission, delta E is zero, which means that if we want the absolute value of delta E, the correct, the correct number with the sign included, it's going to be minus 1.817 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. All right, so this is delta E. Now we can use this in the Bohr equation to solve for the original value of N, okay? So we have this delta E value that we just found. And that's going to be equal to, on the other side, we're using the Bohr equation now. And we're looking for, again, it's 1 over nf squared minus 1 over ni squared. So the final value for Poshin series is always 3, third energy level. And then our unknown in this case is going to be what's the initial value of n that the electron started at. And if we did this right, we should get a value larger than 3 because it's emission. So we're going to solve for the initial value ni. Um, and so I'm going to use the algebra machine to do this and not show all those steps. But what we, what we should get if we do the math correctly is that ni squared, when we solve for that, is equal to 36. And that means ni equals 6. Okay? So that means this is a transition, 1094 nanometers, that starts at n equals 6 and ends up at n equals 3, which makes it part of the Poshin series, which you don't need to know. But uh, anyway, that's how we would solve for it in this case. Um, all right, so that's going to be how you do this one. Again, there's some ways to check yourself on this problem. If you got a number here that was smaller than 3, that must mean you messed up because this is an emission process, and emissions always start at a higher value of n. Or if you got a number that wasn't an integer, like 5.83 or something like that, that also means you must have messed up your math somewhere. So it's helpful to you know, give yourself some of those checks as you do these problems. Don't just you know, pick the answer that you think it is and just move on with your life. Make sure your answer is reasonable and, and that you're thinking about things as you do it. All right, so any questions on this one? Just using the same concepts but working backwards. Yep. Well, it would be technically 6 to 3 because it's a mission. So we're just looking for the level from which the transition originated, that's basically a fancy way of saying the initial end value. So that'd just be six. Yeah. Uh, whoever has it, just blurted it out because I can't see you. Right. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Uh, it says 1,094 nanometers, but why do we treat it as 1.094 nanometers? It's, it's 1.094 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. Yeah. So we're, we're converting nanometers into meters, which we have to do to be able to use the standard uh, form of C, 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Yeah, so lambda and nano and meters is going to be 1094 nanometers times 1 meter over 10 to the 9th nanometers. So it's basically 10 to the 3rd divided by 10 to the 9th, so it comes out to 10 to the minus 6 when you convert to meters. Okay, so it's, it's unit conversion. We have, we have to make sure we do that in all these problems because...
when we're using these photon equations, hc over lambda, h nu, in particular, when we're using lambda, it has to be in, in units of meters before we put it in. So you have to make sure you convert it first. So I skipped that step, but that's what you'd have to do first by dividing by 10 to the ninth. And that should give you 1.094 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay? Anything else? All right, so let's move on to one more. Um, I have these labeled as you try one, but I'm going to do it myself just to keep us moving. Um, all right, so now this question in principle could involve a lot of math because we, we want, we have two situations here, which requires a higher energy photon, moving from n equals one to n equals three in hydrogen or moving from n equals two to n equals four in hydrogen. Now in, in reality, we could do the problem twice. We could basically figure out you know, the energy of the photon for each situation, compare the two numbers, figure out what's larger. But for these types of problems where we're just comparing to, I think in, many, in most cases, we can do it qualitatively by just remembering how the energy levels are arranged. So basically what we're going to do is recall that from the Bohr model, the energy levels start at n equals 1, and they go up to higher values of n, but they get closer and closer together as we move up. All right? So I'm going to try to draw these close to correct. It's probably not that accurate. But the key point is that as we go up to higher values of n, the, the levels get closer and closer together. And so if we're doing, if we're absorbing a photon to move from n equals 3 to n equals, sorry, to n equals 1 to n equals 3 or 2 to 4, if we look at these two possibilities, which I'll do in two different colors here, n equals 1 to n equals 3, we're, we're going basically between two non-consecutive values of n skipping 1. And then if we do n equals 2 to n equals 4, we're also going through two non-consecutive values. And very clearly, because the energy levels get closer and closer together, this is going to be a larger energy gap than this than the, than uh, than the second one. Okay, so this is going to be again n equals one to n equals three is going to be larger than the other one, which is n equals two to n equals four. Here we're looking for the one that requires higher energy, and so the one that's clearly the higher energy of these two is going to be choice A here. All right, so we didn't have to do any math here. We could have done the math just like we did the last few problems and actually calculate the energy. But if you remember the qualitative arrangement of these, in this case, there's no, no question that this one's going to be a larger difference in energy. Because remember, the energy of the photon is equal to the difference in energy between these two levels. These two are clearly further apart than these two is because the levels get closer and closer together as you move up. So for some of these questions, you know, it's tempting to just you know, get your calculator out and go to town with the numbers, which you could do. But a lot of times it's faster and easier to just, you know, think about the concept. So in this class, you're going to, you know, to do really well in this class, you need to be able to relate the conceptual stuff that we teach you to the mathematical part, the numerical part that's going to be important as well. And if you can sort of link those two together, you can a lot of times understand the questions a lot more clearly and, and sometimes do them in a lot faster way than just trying to crunch numbers all the time. Yep. Well, that would be an even larger value. So. I mean, the, the, num the, the values get closer and closer together, but they're still always going to be higher and higher and higher. So it's going to be, you know, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So n equals 1 to n equals 10 would be larger than either of these. Um, there could be comparisons that are ambiguous, you know, like is, you know, is n equals 1 to n equals 3, is that larger or smaller than n equals 2 to n equals 6? That one's not as obvious because you're not going the same gap each time. But like for most of these that we give you on these, you can just draw it a, a qualitative diagram like this and it'll be easy to tell which of the energy gaps is either smaller or so largest or whatever we're asking you. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is the inherent reasoning behind the initial gap? The inherent reasoning between the initial gap? Well that comes from the math. So if you recall that um, the equation that we first gave you was this one here. Energy is minus 2.18 times 10 over n squared. Yeah. So the fact that it's over n squared dictates mathematically that as, as n gets larger to the two consecutive values get smaller and smaller. So basically if you plotted you know, this on the y-axis and this on the x-axis, you would get a plot that sort of goes like asymptotically towards zero and gets each successive point gets closer and closer together in vertical scale. Uh, this because you have, it, it, it's a, well, there's opposite charges, protons in the nucleus, electrons around the nucleus, they're attracted to each other. And typically, um, 
the force of attraction has, I don't know if it's a distance or a distance square dependence, but uh, they, all, they sort of all sort of work into having this n square dependence. So as you get closer and closer to the nucleus, the energy of attraction gets larger and larger in magnitude or more and more negative in sign. Um, and as you get further away, it gets smaller and smaller. And the way it works out mathematically is to have this n square dependence, which is why you see the, the trend that I show you. Um, so it, it all boils down to forces of attraction between protons and electrons, and then the, the equations sort of bear out you know, the, the, the relationships between successive energy levels that we're talking about now. All right, other questions? All right, so now we're going to start talking about, we just, you know, we went through the Bohr model the last, you know, last half of last time, first half of this time. We've been talking about Bohr model and all these different equations. We're still going to, you know, hold you responsible for those, but there are some problems with the Bohr model. It's not sort of the, the best model of the atom as it turns out. So it was a, you know, it was a good starting point, and certainly it was good at predicting the energy levels, predicting the wavelengths of absorption and emission in the hydrogen atom. So, you know, all those things matched up quantitatively very well, but there's some problems with it that we're going to talk about now and some things that aren't quite right with it. So the first thing is, the biggest thing is that it doesn't work at all for multi-electron atoms. I already sort of warned you about that, that if you're going to use the Bohr equation for, you know, for neutral atoms, it's only hydrogen. You could do it for some ions if they only have one electron. But anything that has more than one electron, which is the vast majority of things that we study on Earth, the Bohr model just doesn't work at all. So it doesn't predict the energy levels. It doesn't predict the wavelengths of the photons that are absorbed or emitted. It basically just fails completely. So Bohr model fails to predict the energy levels or anything else associated with those. All right, so it doesn't work for, uh, for anything with more than one electron. If you want to know, you know why is that, the sort of simple reason is that if you have more than one electron, not only do you have attraction between the electrons and the protons in the nucleus, but you also have repulsions between the different electrons. And so those electron-electron repulsions are what actually screws everything up in the Bohr model. It doesn't count for those, so it doesn't work for anything with more than one electron. We'll get into that in more detail later, but what people tried to do is they first, you know, they, they were sort of in disbelief. They're like, well, no, the, the Bohr model it has to work. It's, it's great. Um, you know, they, had, they sort of clung onto it. And so what they tried to do, um, you know, was basically adapt the Bohr model. Basically, well, may, maybe the orbits aren't perfect circles. Maybe they are for hydrogen, but maybe for other things they're more, you know, elliptical in shape. So they tried to model the Bohr model, be mathematically more complicated, but they tried to account for elliptical orbits and it didn't work either. So that wasn't really the solution, okay? So that's what people tried. They tried to adapt the model. So as you do in the scientific method, if your model fails, you try to adapt it, try to refine it. And the first thing they tried, or one of the first things they tried was to include elliptical orbits. So again, circular orbits is what the Bohr model had. Elliptical would be something more shaped like this. Um, they tried to model it in that way, using elliptical instead of circular orbits. But that didn't really improve the situation. So still for, for multi-electron atoms, elliptical orbits doesn't give a, a good picture either. So what they sort of settled on in reality was that um, the truth is that the Bohr model only predicts energy levels for one electron species. So it is still valuable for that. If you're, if you're studying hydrogen, the Bohr model is great because if you want to know the energy levels in hydrogen or anything about the spectroscopic transitions, the absorption and emission of photons in hydrogen, the Bohr model is still great for that, but it only works for that or other one electron species. So that's obviously a big limitation because there are you know, there's one element that has one electron, which is hydrogen. There's 117 elements that have more than one electron. So that's a large part of the periodic table that the Bohr model can't model. Um, and the reason is that what people started to realize was that this nice picture of circular orbits is simply not true. All right. So there are parts of the Bohr model, in particular the equations, that are very valuable because, as I said, they, they do a very good job of predicting energy levels in hydrogen and allowing you to, to calculate transitions and all that stuff. But the physical model of the Bohr model, the circular orbits, the, you know, the nucleus at the center and the electrons sort of orbiting around that, 
That's completely wrong. It's not, that's not true at all. It's not how real atoms behave. So it's a nice, simple, convenient model because it, you know, it's a lot like planets orbiting the sun and it's very simple to picture, it's very simple to rationalize, but it's just simply not the physical reality of the hydrogen atom or any other atom. So um, there was a, they, you know, they knew then that they needed sort of a, a new model, a new, a new mathematical approach to understanding the hydrogen atom and understanding other atoms that have more than one electrons. And sort of the unifying one that works is the Schrodinger equation. Now, mathematically, this is very complicated. You have to at least go through probably calculus three and differential equations. So, you know, probably the only people in this room that could even fully understand the Schrodinger equation are the math majors that we have. If you're not a math major, the math is it's, it's above my head for sure. So it's going to be above most people's heads that aren't actual math majors. So we're not going to give the full mathematical details, but we do want to introduce what it is and sort of some of the features of it. So what the Schrodinger equation looks like is H with a little hat on it, and I'll tell you what that means here in a second, times psi, another Greek letter, equals E times psi. Now you might be thinking, well, this is a stupid equation. That just means H equals E. But H here does not represent a number. It represents actually a, a set of mathematical operations. So the H part of the equation is called a Hamiltonian. Now, if you guys, uh, a lot of you, if you're chemistry or biology majors in particular, you, you will take physical chemistry someday. Um, and this is where you'll talk about all this stuff in a lot more detail than I'm going to give it. But we're going to introduce it here. But a Hamiltonian is a series of mathematical operations. So it's not a number. It's a, a series of operations. And you're going to apply those operations to another, set, another mathematical function, psi. So you're going to basically do mathematical operations on a function, which is psi. And we're going to define that in a second. And then when you do that, you get what's called an eigenvalue, but uh, you're going to basically yield one of the allowed energy states. All right, so it does allow us to then, if you using the Schrodinger equation, we can figure out the different energy levels in you know, hydrogen or any other multi-electron atom, it works as well. Mathematically, you know, super complicated, but it allows us to do that. The real key part of this for us is this other part of the equation, psi. So, so E is still energy here. I'll write that out in case it's not obvious. So E still refers to energy in this case, but the two parts that we want to understand are Hamiltonian to some extent, but we're not going to really ask you much questions about that. But psi here is what we call the wave function. This is sort of the business end of this equation for chemists, okay? And what it does is it describes an electron as a standing wave. So we introduced last week um, the idea of this of wave particle duality, the idea that you know every everything, matter and energy, behaves both as a wave and as a particle. And electrons in particular, which are you know very small and move very fast in most cases, they have a lot of wave-like properties. And so basically, what this Schrodinger equation does, these wave functions psi to describe an electron not as a discrete particle moving in a regular circular path, but actually as a wave that surrounds the nucleus. And it's sort of abstract and weird to think about, but that's what they do. These functions are in terms of x, y, and z coordinates. So they're basically you know, three-dimensional functions that in some sense relate to the position of an electron. In real physical chemistry, they usually do polar coordinates, but it's the same story. It just basically, it's you know, positional coordinates around the nucleus. Um, but it doesn't tell us the exact position of the electron. That's one thing we want to get out of our heads right now, is that this is not an equation that tells you exactly where the electron is at any given time. But what it is, is it, it, as we'll see, it relates to the probability of finding the electron at some position closer or further from the nucleus. All right? So it doesn't tell us the electron's exact position. That's one thing. Again, it's a wave equation, so it doesn't tell us, you know, the electron's going to be here at this particular time, moving in this circular orbit. It's a wave equation that doesn't tell us exact position, um, but as we'll see, it relates to the probability of finding an electron at some place. And then each energy level that we have in an atom, so we're going to talk about these um, as we move forward, you know, multi-electron atoms also have different energy levels available to the electrons, and each energy level has its own wave function associated with it. So basically what, it's, what that means is that there's going to be a lot of different wave functions, a lot of different psi uh, functions that are going to be solutions to this equation. They're going to be parameterized in different ways, and those are going to tell us 
different things about each of those energy levels in the atom. So we're going to, again, we're going to deal with this primarily from a very basic and pictorial standpoint, not looking at the math in any level of detail, but this is kind of the backdrop that we're operating in. Now, another important part of the Schrodinger equation that's sort of built into it in some way is what's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, so if you guys have watched Breaking Bad, you're familiar with the name Heisenberg, but it, so he, he was a famous scientist that came up with this. That was sort of one of his main contributions. We're not going to deal with um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in mathematical terms. So again, I'm going to introduce it to you so you understand it, but we're not going to have any problems on the homework assignment where you have to use this equation. So don't worry about it too much, but we just want to understand what it means. So the idea here is that it, it, there's a few different ways of writing this, but basically one way is that delta x times delta mv must be greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. So basically these delta values here refer to uncertainties. So delta x is the uncertainty in position. So if we're talking about electrons, it's you know how certain can we be that the electron is here versus here? Yes? It's a pi. You guys will figure out my chicken scratch eventually, don't worry. Um, all right, so it's h over 4 pi. Um, and delta x and delta in general in this equation refers to uncertainty. So delta x is uncertainty in position. How certain can we be that the electron is here versus here? If we say that the electron is located, you know, one nanometer from the nucleus, is it exactly one nanometer or is it, you know, somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5 nanometers? How likely, you know, how certain is that position of the electron or anything? And, and you know, this applies to anything in life. M is the mass, so it's just the, in this case, we're talking about electrons, the mass of an electron. And then delta V is the uncertainty in the speed. This is one way of writing the equation. You can also write other forms of the Heisenberg equation that deal with other parameters like energy and stuff like that, but we're doing this sort of standard form here first. Um, and so what this sort of says is that the product of delta X and the product of the uncertainty in the momentum, MV, must be greater than or equal to H over 4 pi. All right, and so sort of, it means that it is impossible to simultaneously know the position and speed of an object. Or more precisely, the position and momentum. So we recall from physics, mass times velocity is momentum. So it sort of limits. If you, if you measure one of those things precisely, the position or the momentum, you can't measure the other one as precisely because the product of those two is limited by h over 4 pi. Now keep in mind, as we've talked about already, h is a very tiny number. So this Heisenberg uncertainty really only matters for very tiny objects. So going back to the analogy I gave last week when we were talking about, what were we talking about? When I was talking about launching a baseball to the back of the room as fast as I could, uh, that was sort of the, that, that was an example I gave of wave particle duality, the Broglie wavelength, you know, what would the wavelength of the baseball be? If we use that same analogy here and I throw a baseball to the back of the room and, you know, how precisely we can measure where the baseball is at any given time so you know when to duck and how precisely we can measure the speed of the baseball, those are going to be determined by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle here. But on the size of a baseball, those uncertainties are going to be extremely, extremely, extremely tiny. So for a large object like a baseball, you know, this equation basically means, well, you, there really is no limit in the, you know, in the certainty of the measurement because the uncertainty values delta x, delta v are going to be extremely small compared to how big the baseball is and how fast it's moving. But if we start talking about things that are really, really tiny like electrons, that sort of limits our ability to precisely measure the position of an electron at a given time. So to understand how that works, let's say we had, and this is again just an illustrative example, not really a problem you'd have to do on the homework assignment, but just to show you how this uncertainty principle works. So if we have an electron that has a speed of 1.0 times plus or minus 0.1 times 10 to the sixth meters per second, what is the uncertainty of position? So let's say we know this, the speed in this and with this level of precision. So this plus and minus 0.1 basically means the speed of the electron is either between 0.9 and 1.1 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So this plus and minus means that we don't know exactly what it is, but it's somewhere between those two. It's either 0.9, 1.1, or somewhere in between those. 
that's sort of how we report it. And we're not dealing with uncertainty a lot in this class, so don't worry too much about that concept. But that's the, uh, the, the speed of the electron. The mass is given here, so what's the uncertainty position, okay? So we're going to use the Heisenberg uncertainty equation where delta V is given to us. It's this plus and minus 0.1 here times 10 to the sixth. So again, that means our speed is somewhere bounded by the, that uncertainty value. We want to write that in more standard forms. That's 1.0 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So basically, this is the uncertainty in our measurement of speed for this hypothetical experiment. So let's see how well can we know the position of x. What's the limit of our uncertainty in x? We're just going to rearrange this. So it's going to be x is going to have to be greater than h over 4 pi times m delta v. All right. So we're going to put the numbers in that we have. h is Planck's constant, the same definition as always for h. And again, because it's a tiny number, this uncertainty principle only really matters for very tiny objects. 4 pi, which is also a constant, and then the mass of the electron we gave here is very small, so 9.11 times 10 to the minus 34, sorry, 31 kilograms, given to us in the problem. And then the uncertainty in velocity, as we said, is this number here. It's how certain we are in that 1 times 10 to the 6th value. There's an uncertainty of 1 times 10 to the 5th meters per second. So when we work out the numbers, what that comes out to, and again, this is purely an illustrative example, not a type of problem you'd have to do, 5.8 times 10 to the minus 8 meters. Now you might think, oh, that's a, that's a tiny uncertainty. Like, who really cares? This uncertainty principle is, you know, is sort of just pedantic and stupid, which is, you know, comes out to 0.58 nanometers. Oh, you know, the, the uncertainty position of the electron is only 0.58 nanometers. That's, you know, a very, very tiny microscopic amount. Why does it really matter? Well, why it matters is that this number here, believe it or not, is 10 times larger than the hydrogen atom, okay? So what this sort of tells us then is that, you know, if we're measuring electrons on the atomic scale, you know, where is the electron in this atom as, you know, it relates to the nucleus, we can't really know where it actually is at any given time. The uncertainty, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, is way too big compared to the size of the atom. We can't know that the electron is here or there or anywhere else. We can just know where it's likely to be probabilistically. So that, those two sort of are related to each other. The, you know, the, the Schrodinger equation, which is, you know, stating the, the equation of electron in terms of a wave equation, and the uncertainty principle, which dictates that we can't actually know where exactly it is, those kind of go hand in hand in why we actually describe the electrons in this way. So it, it is fairly abstract, but the point is that, you know, we can't know where the electron actually is at any given time, so we describe it as a wave equation, and as we'll get into right now, the wave equation is related to the probability of finding the electron at a certain place relative to the nucleus. All right, so to do that, to talk about that, which is going to give us back to a more sort of visual picture of, of the wave equations, we have to talk about some more definitions. So the way that um, chemists refer to wave equations is not usually as wave equations, but as orbitals. And so these are basically synonymous. So I won't use the term wave function too often. I'll use the term orbital, which really means the same thing. Um, there's a slight difference in context. So the wave function is sort of, you know, the mathematical equation psi. Orbitals we usually think of as the region in space where the electron is likely to be found, which is dictated by the, by, by the equation psi. So they're related to each other in that way, but we kind of, we kind of use them interchangeably. Um, so an orbital is basically a synonym for a wave function. And what it allows us to do is, again, determine the probability of finding an electron somewhere at a given position. So we can never know with any certainty where the electron is, but we can know the probability of it being there. And that comes from the wave equation, which is, again, synonymous with orbital. And orbital is usually sort of given as a, a picture, a region in space where the electron is most likely to be found. That's how we sort of think about orbitals in a chemistry context. Now, how those sort of relate to each other is we have two, two sort of probability terms we want to define here. So the first is just called probability density, and that's given by the square of the wave function. So the wave function by itself is very abstract and doesn't tell you a lot, but if you square the wave function psi squared, it gives you a probability of finding the electron at a given point in space, okay? 
All right, so the wave equation squared is the probability of finding an electron All right, so remember that these wave, wave functions psi are in terms of x, y, and z. So you put you know, a certain value of x, y, and z into this equation, and you calculate the probability of finding an electron at that exact position, wherever you want to, want to, want to look for that electron. Um, now, as we'll see, um, it's not that useful to think about you know, how likely is the electron to be exactly right here versus exactly right there. What we're more interested in is how, le how likely is the electron to be a certain distance from the nucleus. Again. You know, is it, is it likely to be you know really close to the nucleus, further away from the nucleus? And so for that, we define what's called radial probability density, which is four pi r squared times psi squared. All right. So it's related to the probability density, but you also multiply that by four pi r squared, where r is the distance from the nucleus that you want to consider. So this is the probability. of finding an electron at a certain distance from the nucleus. All right, so it's helpful to appreciate the differences between these two. Probability density is the probability of finding an electron at a very specific point right here. Probability, radial probability density is the probability of finding it along the surface of a sphere at some distance r from the nucleus. So basically you, you find some, you know, you're some distance from the nucleus, you draw a sphere through that distance, and the radial probability density is the probability of finding an electron anywhere on that sphere. And that's actually a more useful parameter, because what we really care about in chemistry is how far away the electron is from the nucleus, not, not so much where exactly it is at any given time. All right. It's also helpful to then understand these graphically. We're going to do this first for the ground state hydrogen atom. We're going to come back to these later in, in more specific terms. But for now, let's just think about the ground state of hydrogen. So before, we sort of thought about the ground state of hydrogen as, you know, in the Bohr model, as circular orbits around the nucleus. But the, the you know, the wave function model, the, the Schrodinger equation sort of states things in different terms, more in a probability sense. Now, if we plot psi squared, so I'll write this a little bit bigger since you can't see it very well. If we plot psi squared as a function of r, distance from the nucleus, it turns out that this actually goes to infinity as we get closer and closer to the nucleus, and then sort of tails off to zero. All right? So the wave function psi squared for hydrogen, it decreases with r. So as we get further and further away from the nucleus, the electron is less and less likely to be found there at a certain point, and it never goes to zero, though. Now, it approaches zero, but it never quite go there. So, for example, if I had a hydrogen atom here at the front of the room, now we know that hydrogen atoms are tiny. They're on the order of, like, you know, half an angstrom, 0 0.05 nanometers or so. But there would be a non-zero probability that the electron in that hydrogen atom could be found at the back of the room. Now, the probability would be something like 0.01%, you know, a very, very small number, obviously, but there's, it's not zero. So... You know, that's what the Schrodinger equation sort of tells us. We can never know exactly where the electron is. We can just know the probability of it being somewhere. And as you can see, this probability never goes to zero. So actually, you know, anywhere in the universe that electron could in principle be, but those probabilities get, you know, increasingly, increasingly, increasingly smaller the farther away we get. All right. Now, the other thing that might be weird about this to you is that we see that it sort of increases up and up as we get close to the nucleus. You might be thinking like, well, wait a minute, that means the electron is most likely to be right at the nucleus, and that's kind of weird, right? We didn't talk about that before. But remember that that's sort of the probability of finding it at a very specific point really close to the nucleus, but that region of space is very small around the nucleus. So the more useful parameter is what I'm going to show here is 4 pi r squared psi squared, which is the radial probability de uh, density, which would be the sort of distance at finding it a certain radius from the nucleus anywhere along that sphere. And so what you sort of have here then are, are sort of two competing functions because as we go towards larger and larger radius values, 4 pi r squared, the first part of this, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We get to a larger and larger and larger sphere, which means that in some sense it's more likely for the electron to be there because it's a larger unit of volume. But we also see that the psi squared part of this function is going to decrease as we go to larger and larger radiuses. So basically we have two competing functions that we're multiplying together a radius function that goes up and up and up, 
a psi function that goes down and down and down. And so what that leads to is a radial probability density that has a peak associated with it at some distance from the nucleus. So it's going to look something like this for hydrogen. It again never goes to zero, but it does have a value here, which is the most probable radius of finding the electron in the hydrogen atom. All right, so it's not that the most probable place for the electron is at the nucleus, but if you consider the, you know, the size of the, of the region in space around the nucleus, the most probable place is going to be at some distance. So for hydrogen, it's going to be a specific value, what we call the most probable radius, which is 0 0.529 angstroms. Angstroms being 10 to the minus 10 meters. So again, it's about 0 0.05 nanometers, very small. And so that's what the value is for the hydrogen atom ground state. And one thing that's actually kind of cool about this is that I didn't give you the, you know, the radius equation from the Bohr model, but the Bohr model has a radius equation associated with it. And the radius for ground state hydrogen is exactly this number here. So there's actually good agreement between the two models. The difference is that the Bohr model would say that in the ground state, the electron is exactly at that radius at all times, moving in a perfect circle. The wave function, the, the Schrodinger equation, would say that this is the most likely radius to find the hydrogen atom, but in reality it could be anywhere, really close to the nucleus, really far away from the nucleus. This is just the radius where it's most likely to be found. So that's kind of the difference between the two, even though numerically they work out to be the same. Now usually the way that we define these distributions is not so much in these sort of mathematical terms, but we define as sort of a 90% probability region. So we'll take the area of this curve and we'll, sh we'll consider 90% of it. This shading is not going as well as I'd hoped, but we're getting there. Um, I need to still fix the settings on this because it's a new tablet. Anyway, so we would, we would basically consider some value up to which what we call the 90% probability region. Now, I just shaded it approximately here, so I don't know if I did a good job or not. But basically, we would find some radius value here where the electron is likely to be at that radius or closer to the nucleus 90% of the time. And that's sort of how we define then the shape of the orbital, which we're going to really talk about more next time. But this is what we call the 90% probability region for the hydrogen atom. And the shape of that, as this diagram sort of shows up here, is going to be a sphere. So basically, if you're sort of plotting the probability distribution for hydrogen, it's going to have, you know, the darker color means that it's more probable to find it there. The lighter color means it's less probable. And there's going to be some region in space where you're going to likely find the electron 90% of the time. And that's usually how we define what an orbital looks like. What shape is the orbital? How big is the orbital? We're going to talk about that, as I said, more next time. But for a hydrogen atom, 90% of the time it's going to be, you know, I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's going to be some distance from the nucleus and it's going to be within that sphere of some value. So, again, the key point of all this is that wave equations, wave functions are a probabilistic model of how we sort of determine where the electron is likely to be around the nucleus, but we can't know exactly where it's going to be um, at any given time. All right, now again, what we want to talk about in more detail now are how do we sort of characterize the different energy levels, the different types of orbitals that we have in an atom. All right, so these all were related to the wave function psi. And wave, the wave functions are very mathematically complex, but they all have certain parameters in them that are very simple. So that's sort of how we want to think about them. It's not in really in, in terms of the whole equation, but these parameters that go into the equation that define the different types of orbitals we have and the different energy levels that are present. So we're going to talk, now talk in more detail about quantum numbers. We introduced one quantum number for the Bohr model, which is n. For real atoms, we actually have three or four we, need, four we need to consider. Three we'll talk about today. And basically what a quantum number is, is it's a series of integers. We'll see next time that one of them is not integers. But for a wave equation, they're all integers. And they're all part of the wave function psi. So I'm not actually going to give you any of the full wave equations. You're welcome to look them up if you're... Um, you know, mathematically inclined to do so and, and want to, but basically all these equations psi have a series of parameters associated with them that are, that are simple integers, simple whole numbers. And this combination of quantum numbers allows us to describe the energy shape and orientation of an orbital. All right, and so... You know, thinking back to hydrogen, we said just now that the shape of the hydrogen ground state orbital is a sphere. And the reason is because when you solve the wave equation and get psi for the ground state of hydrogen, 
these quantum numbers that, that you come up with define a spherical shape in space. So again, it's mathematically kind of abstract. We're not giving you all those details, nor are we equipped to handle them. But these are sort of the parts of the wave equation that we want to understand are these quantum numbers. So there are three quantum numbers that describe every single orbital. And the first one is n. So the, again, relationship back to the Bohr model. The first quantum number is still called n, and it still has the same allowed values, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So basically, each set of quantum numbers, n, and we're going to give three of them, each set of quantum numbers defines an individual orbital. The first of those three quantum numbers is always n, and it can have a few different values, uh, or you know, many different values, starting with 1, up to 2, 3, 4, and so on. What's helpful for us to think about, first we have to know the relationship between the quantum numbers, but also what do they tell us about the orbital. And so what n tells us is it's, it's referred to as the principal quantum number. I hope I, I use the right form of principal because I can never remember. Um, but basically what it tells us is the energy and size of the orbital. All right, and so again, there's some relationships to the Bohr model. The Bohr model said the larger value of n, the farther away from the nucleus the electron is, and same with the quantum mechanical model for the, for the atom. The larger the value of n, on average, not, not in absolute sense, but on average, the electron is going to be further and further away from the nucleus. Basically, the probability density shifts to, to values further and further away from the nucleus as the value of n gets larger, and also the energy increases as a result. A synonym for this is the shell number. So if you talk about the first shell in an atom, you're talking about the orbitals that have n equals 1. If you're talking about the second shell, that's n equals 2, and so on. All right, so we're going to use the word shell in some cases to describe this as well. The second quantum number is L, script L, so I'll sort of draw it like that, which is basically a lowercase l. And the values of the other two quantum numbers depend on the value of n. So they all depend on each other in some sense. So the value of L can range, it starts at 0, is the smallest value of L. And then the largest value of L is going to be n minus 1. So depending on what the value of n is for the wave function or for the orbital, that's going to determine which values of L you can have. And it's going to be all values in between, so 0 to n minus 1. So if n equals 2, it would be 0 and 1 and so on. So it's, it's any value that fits in there. What this is technically referred to as is the angular momentum quantum number. So when you solve for... When you solve the wave equation, the Schrodinger equation, and get the wave function, the L part of the wave function, that parameter, relates to the angular momentum of the electron. Not a very useful quantity in chemistry, but that's what it is. But what it is useful for us in the case of chemistry is that it tells us the shape of the orbital. Okay? All right, and again, the shape of the orbital for ground state hydrogen was a sphere. But not all orbitals are spheres. There's different shapes for orbitals. We're going to talk about a few of them next time. And so the value of L tells you what shape the orbital is. Is it a sphere or is it something else? Okay. Now the other thing that L does is it contributes to the energy of the electron. Now that's going to be true in cases when you have more than one electron. All right. So we want to make sure we understand this key difference here. If you have a one electron system, just like the Bohr equation tells us, the energy only depends on N. But if you have more than one electron, two, three, four, however many electrons you have, the energy of the electron and what orbital it's in is going to be determined by both n and l together. So in multi-electron systems, greater than one electron, the second quantum number l, the angular momentum quantum number, is also going to contribute to the energy. So you need to know both n and l to decide whether the electron is a certain energy level or another. So it's determined by both of those. And then the third quantum number that defines an orbital is going to be called m sub l. And that's going to be determined by the value of L. So the, the largest value of M sub L is L, and then it's going to go down to negative L and every number in between. All right, and it includes zero. All right, so M sub L has the values from negative L to plus L and everything between all integer values in between that as well. And what this tells us is referred to as the magnetic quantum number. So this doesn't determine the energy of the electron at all, um, unless you're in a magnetic field, which we're usually not. So um, it doesn't really determine the energy of the electron, but what it does tell us about the orbital is the orientation of the orbital. So for orbitals that are not spherical shaped, which there are, there are some we'll talk about, 
they can be arranged in different directions in space along the x, y, and z coordinates. And m sub l is related to that. So basically, each m sub l value gives you a different orientation of the orbital in space. So those are the three quantum numbers that define an orbital. And then what we're going to close with today is a little bit more about some of these. We'll probably have to skip a couple slides here today. Um, but the second quantum number, L, tells you what type of orbital you have. Um, and so as we said, L determines the shape of the orbital. So if you have an NL pair together, a value of N and a value of L together as part of the orbital, that's referred to as a subshell or sublevel. So an NL pair is referred to as a sublevel or subshell. And the value of L in this pair is going to tell you what type of orbital you have. Let me do this later. So basically, the values of L that you can have, which depend on the value of N, but they can be 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So the smallest value of L is always 0. The largest value of L is N minus 1. So depending on what the value of N is, you can have different values of L. And typically speaking, though, we don't use the numbers to, de to designate L or to designate what type of orbital we have. So we're usually going to use letter designations for those, which you may have heard of before. So if L equals 0, we call that an S orbital or an S sublevel. We kind of use the two interchangeably in some sense. So any time when L equals 0, that's an S orbital. As we'll learn next time, those are spherical-shaped orbitals. But if L equals 1, we call those P orbitals. L equals 2 is a D orbital. L equals 3 is an F orbital. And from there, they go alphabetically, G, H, and so on. We skip the, we skip the um, vowels typically. But you have S, P, D, F, and then G, and H, and so on. These four types of orbitals here, S, P, D, and F, meaning L equals 1, 0, 1, 2, or 3, those are the types that occur in the ground states of real atoms. So every, as we'll learn more next time, every ground state of an atom has the electrons arranged in different orbitals, and those are all going to be some combination of S, P, D, and F. So you're never going to see any higher order orbitals, G, H, and so on, in the ground state of an atom. It could be in the excited state. If you, you know, they absorb light, you can promote to one of those. But in the ground state of an atom, it's going to be either S, P, D, or F is the type of orbital that the electron is in. And then, as I said already a little bit, there's this sort of relationship between the different quantum numbers. And we're just going to sort of illustrate that here, and we'll probably close with this uh, today. So as we said, the value of n can be 1, 2, 3, and so on, any, any positive integer. The value of l goes from 0 to n minus 1, and the value of m sub l goes from minus l to plus l. So the different values that you can have are, of course, determined by the other quantum numbers. So when n equals 1, which is the lowest value of n you can have, as we said, that's the ground state for hydrogen, the value of L can go to the, from 0 to n minus 1. Well, in this case, n is 1, n, n minus 1 is 0, so the only allowed value of L is going to be 0 in this case. So for n equals 1, you can only have L equals 0. And then if L equals 0, negative L to plus L is also only going to be 0. So it's going to be just 0. So when n equals 1, the only value of L you can have is 0. The only value of m sub L you can have is 0. So there's only one allowed value of each. But if we go to an n equals 2 uh, shell, now we have a more complicated situation. Maybe draw this a little bit over here. So if L equals 2, there are now two values of L. So the smallest value of L is always 0. But then we can also have a value of L that goes up to n minus 1. In this case, n is 2. n minus 1 is equal to 1. So there's also the possibility of having L equals 1. So remember that it's not just that you have only one value of L. You can have either value. So if n equals 2, L could be either 0 or 1. It can be both. And then if n equals 2 and L equals 1, the only allowed m sub L value is still going to be 0 because it's determined by L minus L to plus L is still going to be only 0. But then if we have L equals 1, we can see that there are going to be three possible values of m sub L. So m sub L can go all the way from minus L, which in this case is minus 1, all the way to plus L, which is plus 1, and then also anything in between, including 0. So what this means is that when n equals 2, we have more possibilities. We can have n equals 2, L equals 0, L equal, m sub L equals 0, or we can have L equals 2, sorry, n equals 2, L equals 1, and then three possible m sub L values.
each set of three values designates one orbital that's possible. So we're going to go through these in more detail next time, get a couple example problems, and then we're going to work into the shapes of the orbitals, which is really how we think about them in chemistry.